My name is Jonathan Gaisman. I am a barrister and I have practised in commercial law all my professional life. I am going to talk a little about why I have chosen to found and endow a prize for German literature under the auspices of the Oxford German Network. The real reason why I have wanted to institute this prize is simply a desire to share something which I passionately enjoyed and which I hope others will passionately enjoy. The aim is to focus on German classical literature, that is, in the period from the second half of the 18th century to the first few decades of the 20th century. And the reason for that is because this is the high point, it seems to me, of German literature. I was lucky enough at school to become acquainted with some of these classical texts. I'm thinking of plays by Schiller, such as Maria Stuart. I'm thinking of Prince Friedrich von Homburg by Kleist. But there is one work which is relevant to this year's prize and which I'm tempted to say towers above even the greatest plays of Shakespeare, and that brings us on to Goethe's Faust. I have several copies of Goethe's Faust, but the one I'm looking at now is my first one, in which I've written in the front my name and the date, 1973, when I was 16. It is covered in spidery notes in capitals, written rather eccentrically in a purple felt-tip pen, which I was obviously rather keen on at the time. Goethe's Faust is written in two parts. It actually took him about 60 years to write from beginning to end. The prize is concerned with part one, which is shorter and undoubtedly easier and more immediately appealing. The story concerns three main characters. Faust, the world-weary academic. The devil himself, Mephistopheles. And an innocent, pious girl, Gretchen. The two main elements in Faust part one are the relationship between Faust and Mephistopheles, which is like a great and cosmic chess game, a struggle for mastery, and secondly, the seduction by Faust, with the help of Mephistopheles, of Gretchen. Faust part two is the further adventures of Faust and Mephistopheles, and just as part one ends with the redemption of Gretchen, so part two ends with the redemption of Faust. The Faust legend goes back almost as far as Christianity itself, it's far more than a tale about good and evil, although it is a tale about good and evil. It begins in the grandest terms with a bet between God and the devil. The first scene is set in heaven, and Goethe does not flinch from something which very few dramatists have ever attempted, which is a conversation between the deity and Mephistopheles. The question is whether Mephistopheles will be able to corrupt the soul of Faust, who God identifies as his Knecht, his servant. And so there's a wager. What follows is a struggle for mastery. Another bet is struck. It's actually a bet the nature of which scholars still argue about. But to me, it seems that at one level, there is the conventional Faustian pact. You serve me during my lifetime, and I will give my soul to you when I die. But Goethe overlays on that a much more interesting element to the bet which is that Faust will only give his soul to the devil after he dies if, in this life, the devil can give him a moment which is so sublime, and remember this is Faust who is the epitome of dissatisfaction, that Faust will say to that moment in the English translation, tarry a while thou art so fair. Wenn ich zum Augenblicke sage, verweile doch, du bist so schön, dann magst du mich in Fesseln schlagen, Dann will ich gern zu Grunde gehen. So that's the bet, and the whole of the rest of the poem is Mephisto's attempt to bring about that moment. The main focus of Faust Part One is a tragedy. It's a bürgerliches Trauerspiel. It's a bourgeois tragedy, which was a German 18th century form. It's what's called the Gretchen Tragödie. It's a love story. It's counterpointed by Mephistopheles's astonishing and incredibly appealing at one level cynicism. There's a good example of that when the seduction of Gretchen is approaching and Mephistopheles says, Nun heute Nacht? Now, what about tonight? And Faust rather primly says, Was geht's dich an? What's it got to do with you? And Mephistopheles says, 
hab ich doch meine Freude dran. I get my bit of pleasure in it too. And that sort of rejoinder appealed to me very much, age 16 or 17. The main sexual interest, if I can put it that way, in part two is of a much more cerebral nature, the love affair between Faust and Helen of Troy. And that is, in a sense, a much less earthly concern. It's, as much as anything, the marriage between the northern way of seeing the world and the classical way of seeing the world. Faust is proud, he is the wisest man on earth, but he is world-weary to the point of suicide. He is desperate for revelation, he's rejected religion, he's dabbling in magic, and he also has this very strongly German proto-romantic desire to immerse himself in nature. Faust is extremely loquacious. He expresses himself in the most glorious verse. For example, quite early on, when he's walking with his pupil Wagner, Faust utters, really, it's a hymn to the arrival of spring. I'm just going to read ten lines of this speech, because it's marvellous in German, and I hope it will convey something of the poetry of Faust. Vom Eise befreit sind Strom und Becher, durch des Frühlings holden, belebenden Blick, im Tale grünet Hoffnungsglück, Der alte Winter in seiner Schwäche zog sich in rauer Berge zurück. Von dort her sendet er fliehend nur ohnmächtige Schauer körnigen Eises im Streifen über die grünende Flur. Aber die Sonne duldet kein Weißes. Überall regt sich Bildung und Streben. And that word streben is almost the key word in Faust. It means striving. And Faust, more than anything, is a striver. He struggles. He struggles to wisdom. He struggles for experience. And in the end, 12,000 lines later, at the end of Faust Part Two, in spite of a career in which he's left a trail of destruction and death behind him, he is saved because he has always striven. Wer immer strebend sich bemüht, den können wir erlösen. Whoever strives with all his heart, we can redeem. The angels sing in heaven in the last scene of Faust Part Two. There's a famous scene in Faust's seduction of Gretchen in which she cross-questions him about the nature of his faith. And Faust produces a whole series of windy proto-romantic evasions. But what wonderful poetry they are. Famously, when he's trying to define God, he says... Gefühl ist alles, Name ist Schall und Rauch, umnebelnd Himmelsglut. That's completely untranslatable, really, but what he's saying is that feeling is everything. What you call the deity by is just so much smoke, the fog of the glory of heaven. One of the features of the Gretchen tragedy is that Mephistopheles can only conceive of Faust's feelings for Gretchen in his own, in Mephistopheles' own debased coinage, whereas Faust, at least arguably, returns what in the end becomes Gretchen's pure and unconditional love for him. Faust begins to protest against the path of destruction down which Gretchen has been led and rails against Mephistopheles. There's a magnificent oath where he calls him Du Spottgeburt von Dreck und Feuer. And Mephistopheles can only react by saying, Sie ist die Erste nicht. She's not the first. And you have this insight into Mephistopheles' career of corrupting women since the dawn of time. There is a, a scene which is called Walpurgisnacht, which is a witch's Sabbath in the Hartz Mountains, where there is a great deal of raunchy sexual text. This is juxtaposed with the more conventionally romantic relationship between Faust and Gretchen, but there's a lot of sensuality in that too, not least in Gretchen's singing of Meine Ruhe ist hin, which is a poem and, in Schubert's setting, a song which is heavy with sexual longing. An astonishing song, Schubert's first great song, written when he was only 17 years old. The last scene of Faust Part One takes place in the condemned cell, 
Gretchen has been condemned to death for causing the death of her mother and the death of her baby. It is a very harrowing scene. There are Shakespearean elements in it. One's reminded of Ophelia in Hamlet because the balance of Gretchen's mind has become disturbed. Faust and Mephistopheles arrive to rescue her. But after a great struggle, and despite Faust's increasing desperation, she's true to her religion, she's true to her old self, and she rejects Faust. The last thing she says to him is that he horrifies her. Heinrich mir grauts vor dir. Mephistopheles triumphantly says, Sie ist gerichtet. She is condemned. And a voice from heaven says, Ist gerettet. She is saved. She is redeemed. So Faust part one ends with this continuing struggle between good and evil, between Faust and Mephistopheles over Gretchen, and who knows who's going to win it. Part two is the further career of Faust and Mephistopheles, and all I want to mention is the very last scene. Faust dies. He never quite says the words of the bet to an existing moment, tarry a while thou art so fair. He says it conditionally and in the future, at last after a career of selfish pleasure-seeking, and although he is by now old and blind and dying, he has an ecstatic vision of the future, of service to humanity in the form of a land reclamation scheme in which people will be able to live and farm on land that was previously underwater. And after saying how much he'd like to see humanity and children leading this virtuous and worthwhile life, he says, Zum Augenblicke dürft ich sagen, verweile doch, du bist so schön. To the passing moment, then I could say, so it's future and it's conditional, I could say, tarry a while thou art so fair. Mephistopheles thinks that's good enough, but it isn't. Angels pelt roses, in a rather beautiful image, at the devils who are dragging Faust's soul to hell, and the roses burn the devils because they're so beautiful and so pure. And in fact, Faust is taken towards heaven. He obviously has had a terrible career of evil doing behind him under Mephistopheles' auspices. But we read that a penitent woman, formerly known as Gretchen, intercedes with the Virgin on Faust's behalf. And this is a wonderful reversal of their roles in part one. In part one, Faust was wise. Gretchen was an uneducated girl. But now Gretchen has the spiritual authority to intercede for Faust's soul with the Virgin, and the Mater Gloriosa, as she's described, grants her prayer. This scene is particularly poignant because at the height of her agony in part one, Gretchen prays to a statue of the Virgin in church, Neige, neige, du Schmerzensreiche, incline to me, you who are literally rich in pain or understand so much about human pain, I suppose is a translation, and in the closing scene of part two, she says, Neige, neige, du ohne gleiche. So the language is different. Incline to me, you without compare. It's a very touching echo. It's even more touching in the setting by Schumann of scenes from Goethe's Faust. Schumann sets both of these scenes, Gretchen before Mary in part one, full of agony, and the scene in part two when she is interceding for Faust's soul. Der früh geliebte, nicht mehr getrübte, er kommt zurück. My early beloved, his mind no longer clouded, he returns to me. And the setting in Schumann's Faust uses the same music, just as the text is similar. Although the imagery at the end is conventionally Christian, the metaphysics and the morality are far from conventional. Faust has done almost nothing to deserve salvation. He hasn't even repented, unlike Gretchen. But what he has done and this corresponds to deep preoccupations of Goethe's throughout his life, is he's gone on struggling. He's gone on seeking. That is why Faust is saved, not because he deserves salvation in a conventional Christian sense, but because he never gives up the struggle. <laughs>